And, and seemingly they all had this same, almost verbatim, that Irish and Scottish settlers were the first non-native settlers in Great County. But then stories were told to me about some of those early Scottish families that moved into Southern Grey, particularly around Priceville, and how some of them had written letters back home to relatives in Scotland and described the dark people that they met here when they arrived. Jennifer, I suspect that bit of news is going to come as a tremendous revelation to almost everybody watching this program right now. And th that's why we need your help in getting to the bottom of this, because your documentary shows that that fact has essentially, never mind has been forgotten, but has been virtually wiped out of our history books. Um, how did that happen? Well, definitely, it's an it's a it's a issue of erasure, and so it's essentially, Priceville was a small been there for a good been there for a good 20, 30 years their land was given to the white settlers. And so that meant that they had to leave. And so there was violence in some cases where they were forced out of those communities and Priceville was essentially taken away from them. And so they went off into places like Owen Sound. And so that history though, has been slowly eradicated. Um, and, and another part of the history is that um, when people think of um, black folks, they always think of people that look like myself, so darker skinned, especially when they think of slaves, um, you know, or enslaved people. They think of darker skinned people. And in actual fact, uh, some of these uh, black folks were very light skinned, which is how they actually managed to even get to Canada. And, um, and so there was a situation where some of these folks actually intermarried into the white community. And that, that, that uh, genetics was something that people didn't want, want to talk about. They, and so there was a number of reasons why that black history has been essentially eradicated from the history books, so that by the time the 50s rolled around, almost no one even knew Colonel Price was a black man. Yeah, Lise, could you pick up the story here? Because this is not the only place in the province of Ontario where the black presence has essentially been written out of our history books. How does that happen? Well, it happens in several ways. When people buy property, they have deeds. Um, we, black people, uh, are always depicted as squatters. That's because we weren't necessarily told that we had to have deeds. Uh, when we were enslaved, we weren't allowed to legally read and write. We didn't know all of the social norms and ways of having property and so um, we found ourselves having settled cleared built homes and put in crops and then the Irish and other European settlers came along and knew about getting deeds and things like that and that's how we lost property that's an interesting double standard, isn't it? Squatters yes, versus settlers. If, Thank you. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're Irish or Scottish, you were a settler. If you were black, you were a squatter. Correct. See, Absolutely. And I fought diligently to um, equalize language. That is to say, the history of black people, we use words towards them like fugitives. That means someone running from crimes they committed. We were refugees. We were running from crimes committed against us. And normalizing language will certainly help in allowing people to better understand the Black experience. Hmm. Jennifer, as I pointed out earlier, your documentary came out more than 20 years ago. And I wonder if you could um, remind us how it was received when it first came out. So, so here's the thing. The documentary came out um, about 20 years ago. It was our first film. Actually, I, I, I co-directed this film with my partner, Sud Sutherland, and it was our first film. And um, it, was, it was really interesting. Um, we believe that we brought to the Canadian story um, elements that people just didn't know. And, but there was not that 
big of interest. For example, we didn't get into hot docs. Um, CBC did pick up the, 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 the film, um, but there was almost no press around it. Interestingly enough, in the U.S., we had, um, we had ma uh, major networks contact us about the film, and, um, and we've actually had quite a bit of um, black Americans uh, that have, have uh, reached out about it. In fact, uh, most recently, about two years ago, Suds, um, my co-director, and I were invited to Harvard um, by the uh, Canadian chair at Harvard uh, because uh, she uses our film She's a professor, and she uses her film all the time in her in her lectures. And we were invited to Harvard to give a talk about Black Canadian history. But as uh, as for the Canadian side of it, it it really hasn't been given the I guess the the support or the weight that that of of this story because here it is. Um, Black folks have had a real impact in the creation of this country. And I, myself, I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada when I was very young, when I was five or six years old. And, um, but I was taught in school almost entirely um, a history that had no Black people in it. And when it did, it was Black American history, right? Hmm. So we have a problem in this country where we don't know the significant amount of Black history there is here. Can I just get, hang on? I got I got to follow up on that. You got invited to go to Harvard to give a presentation about your film, but no post-secondary institution in the province of Ontario gave you an invitation. Um, not in Ontario, actually. To be truthful, um, uh, um, the the um, the Harvard chair is Canadian. So it's a Canadian chair uh, of Harvard. So she actually is a she's a she was a professor out of Montreal who uses our film on a regular basis. But we have actually never been invited by anybody in Ontario <laughs> uh, uh, to screen the film in a university capacity. Well, you're laughing about it, but I presume those laughs are are covering up tears. I mean, that's that's kind of outrageous, isn't it? Um if you're a black person in Canada, look, you are, <laughs> this is just how it works. Now, here, here's the thing. Remember a few months ago when um, George Floyd was murdered um, and, and all of the um, social justice cries echoed all over the world? Um, we had politicians saying that we did not have this problem in Canada because we didn't have slaves. We had, we had people saying that black folks are so much better off here that we don't have those crime problems. Yet Scott Worthley, uh, a professor at U of T, did a study with the police that came out maybe about six, six weeks or two, six weeks ago that essentially said black folks were 20 times more likely to be killed by the police in Canada. So... Yeah. We have politicians who have zero idea about the black history in this country, right? So that's that's surprising, you know. The you know the fact that the film hasn't been given, I, I think, the weight that it's it's due. So this is an opportunity for all of us to learn. I think so, you know. Um, and I'm not saying, by the way, that the film has not had impact. You know, uh, for one thing, in the Priceville community, it's actually, I believe, it's helped change that community, that Owen Sound community. I was talking to, uh, well, both Elise, actually, and um, other scholars like um, Carolyn Smarts, and they said that in those communities, this film is shared and and um, and really well loved, and everyone acknowledges the history that it presents. In addition to that, um, the um, a, a monument had been created for the four um, s uh, stones that had been found in a in a stone pile. Uh, these are the gravestones that had been found in a, in a stone pile. A monument had been created, and it, and it became quite dilapidated. And in 2013 to 2016, um, funding was given to create a wonderful structure to preserve those gravestones. And I believe that this film and the, the bringing this story to light had something to do with that. I see. Uh, Elise, let's get you back in here. How many generations, we know a, a bit now about Jennifer's background, so let's find out about yours. For how many generations have you and yours been in Canada? Black side of my family has been in Canada since 1798. I am a seventh generation Canadian. Um, okay, my reaction to that is wow. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know too many white folks who go back that far. No, I don't either. <laughs> Where did your people come from? 
Well, uh, some came from uh, Virginia. Some come, came from Maryland. Um, the last branch of the family that came in the late 1840s came from Missouri. And why do you think that we know so little about Colonel Price, the United Empire loyalist, who, after whom Priceville was named? Because he was a black United Empire loyalist. And largely, by 1811, the names of black United Empire loyalists were largely stricken from the rolls. Um, we have to put ourselves into the mindset of the time. This was still when slavery was legal on the entire North American continent. Colonel Price and many people like him who came to Ontario had made the decision to fight for Great Britain, which made them loyalists. And the land grants that they got were in areas that uh, the white loyalists didn't necessarily want because it was too hard to clean or drain or uh, cut down the forest. We were more than willing to take that. We had worked under similar conditions under enslavement and that didn't bother us. But again, I'm saying we weren't given socialized information on how to own something, just taking it over and clearing it up and promising to meet guidelines and stipulations like clearing five acres within three years or paying off the price of the property within 10 years. Um, little tricks were played hmm. and the property was taken away. Uh, Elisa, I wonder if I could follow up with this. Again, I want you to take us back. The black community had established itself in Priceville, and then white settlers came into the area. And I wonder if you could just give us some more information about that first contact, how it all went. Well, there would be several ways in which it would go. Um, the black families most probably invited the white families into their homes until they could get their own properties cleared and built. Um, the white settlers may have been a little bit jealous of what they were seeing. You know, after all, European immigrants were coming from hard times as well. The Irish came here with the first potato famine. Um, they were under colonization from the British. They had very little themselves. And to see others who were racially sub not appreciated. Uh, I'm trying to be very diplomatic about the way I say this. I noticed things. that. That was a very gentle way of putting it. <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> and then there could have been, as Jennifer said, mixed marriages. And so over the course of even two generations, we can blend out. Hmm. And people wouldn't know that we were black unless they were told. And so in order to not be ashamed of themselves or to take on the guise of a white person, they would shun their black family. Hmm. Jennifer, was it also the case that if you were a white family and you worked the land for the year, it was yours? If you're a black family, not the case. Is that true? Absolutely. In, in actual fact, um, some of the, the settlers, the white settlers, targeted land that had, uh, that had already been cleared, that there weren't any deeds. And so, and so, and within a year, <laughs> uh, because they, they, they had land that had actually been prepared for them, uh, essentially, they were able to move in and establish, you know, the community. And, um, and so, and as you know, with, with, with Priceville, after uh, you know whites took over the community, um, the only remnants was the cemetery, and what actually happened was a farmer, um, Billy Reed, plucked all these, the uh, gravestones and um, essentially pitched some of them into a stone pile, floored his uh, stable, 
and the and his basement with the with the um the gravestones and of course um one one gentleman Stuart Muir who was an older gentleman in the film he talked about them using uh, a gravestone as home plate so you know there was no respect for for uh the the black lives that that you know was there before the blacks live that had um that had done all of this work um you know uh, there was no value placed on them and so you know it's it is though a part of the history and and here's the thing at every turn white loyalists white folks have been given the means to succeed um right. whether it be access to homes grants um uh land grants even loans things that were denied black folks so every you know so make no mistake in canada at every everything that happened in the us except perhaps the the um uh aggressive violence all of those same things happened here hmm. and one of the things that helen miller says is that it was the same it was the same but we didn't have the signs elise i guess if you really want to erase history one of the best ways to do it is just get rid of the cemeteries because they are wonderful repositories of historical record how That's how absolutely. how widespread was that practice in this province all those years ago province wide hmm. uh you were talking about uh, the markers being taken off by mr reed when i was at the museum i had a similar instance where a gentleman came with uh, several broken pieces of markers in the back of his truck and he asked does this place want to take these or uh, i'm going to go throw them in the dump and he too raised potatoes on the property we kept the markers and made a memorial cemetery at the back of the museum and as for uh being better than in the united states we had violence here too as late as uh, 1955 a gentleman was killed in the collingwood area because his co-workers were jealous of the fact that he had been made a supervisor he was a veteran of the second world war and on a particular day they wanted to see a monkey swing the one worker took his foot off the brake and the gentleman was killed oh. and nothing has ever been done about it hmm. Jennifer you told us earlier that you were a young kid when you came to Canada mm -hmm. and i wonder how much how much uh knowledge or history of the black experience uh in this country did you learn when you first got here <laughs> um none um you know Steve, i have to say that i'm a filmmaker because of the lack of information i grew up i love i i love being canadian and i and i i have you know i'm married i have three kids and it's like my roots here i love also my jamaican heritage but here's the thing i learned almost nothing and i felt like i did not belong in this country for a very long time because there was nothing when you don't see yourself um or when you don't hear that the, when there's just nothing there you you there is a there's a longing and a lack and so i have always been a storyteller from a from a young child and um and so part of the reasons i became a filmmaker was because i wanted to tell these stories because i was i cuz i i remember the hurt of feeling like i didn't belong a feeling like you know there was nothing that grounded us into this place so um yeah there was almost nothing uh, there was some american history for the most part actually mm -hmm. that uh, it was black stories um and it was so grounded in say slavery and the context was certainly not um it, you know slavery was bad but that was literally the start and the end of it um and as you know um you know you you felt um you were left to feel um embarrassed by it well let's look a little bit more of your work shall we <laughs> let's do that children if you would the next clip from her documentary Priceville is not mentioned. The settlers of the old Durham Road are not mentioned in the general, the very few books on general black history in Canada. There is a overriding 
conspiracy, a non-conspiracy maybe, of silence in the community where people just don't talk about it. And that's the way they were trained. Don't talk. If you don't say it, it doesn't exist. And a lot of them were hushed up when they were kids. And for me, I've been difficult to shut up all my life. There's Les McKinnon again. Jennifer, have you been heartened by the fact that uh, there are white people in Priceville who are championing your cause now? Oh, absolutely. Listen, this came together because um, black descendants had actually, for decades, had been looking for their ancestors. And they were lied to, and it was never told to them. And at some point in the 80s, guys like Les McKinnon, uh, um, you know, um, and some, I was thinking of some of the other folks on the, the committee, Clausine Catcher, the Catchers, um, Chris and Clausine, um, uh, folks like that, they formed a committee. And this happened in the late 80s. And, um, and they formed this committee uh, with the black folks. And it was essentially about uh, reclaiming this history. And look, at the end of the day, right, I really think that we can't, we can't actually do this work alone. Uh, this, I, this idea that we must be allies in the reclaiming of these stories is something I'm completely and um, uh, absolutely invested in. You know, mind you, it actually should have the black folks leading the charge, but there there needs to be allies in this uh, in the reclaiming of this history. Well, let's find out from Elise. Do you see that happening enough? Is this veil of silence over the black involvement in the province's history? Is it finally lifting? Yes, it is. Uh, very slowly and very painfully. <laughs> um, I can say chapter and verse repeating what Jennifer has said, uh, with the exception of the fact that when I was in school and slavery was mentioned, it was a matter of fact thing uh, that happened, and we were happy about it. Because after all, we had been rescued from Africa, uh, a place where we were savages. Um, it was very hurtful. Hmm. And it was very angering. And I, in my own way, have worked on presenting and preserving Black history since I was a child. Um, I've been very fortunate to meet people like Jennifer. Uh, we are of a like mind. Um, you know, there are good white people and there are good black people, but good white people are listened to first because of systemic thinking. The traditional thought and the prejudging, which is the prejudice that happens right here in Canada, that we are less educated, we're less knowledgeable. Um, our word is not as sacred as others. And uh, there have been many legislations against us. Black people were not invited to become Canadian citizens until 1911, Steve. Um, and, you know, I really want to ask you how you've managed, and I'll use your word from earlier, You've managed to keep your diplomatic demeanor in spite of clearly the, the hurt and the pain that you feel deep down over the years. How have you done that? I've managed to separate myself from it. I've been uh, severely hurt and angered by things people have said and done um, about the whole history itself. You know, claiming of uh, things that we have done, the taking of our property, desecration of our graves. Uh, at one town close to me that uh, during their fair, they used the grave site for overflow parking. That's one of the reasons I got the award that I was telling you about a little earlier in preservation. I've helped to preserve 13 black cemeteries in Essex County and several across the country because people have connected with me. Um, I've become authority on some of these things and that's how I've kept my anger down. And that's also what's kept me seeking 
knowledge and uplifting black thread in the Canadian tapestry. That's wonderful. And congratulations on getting that award. It is so well deserved. And I should say as well that the Canadian Media Producers Association have given an award uh, to the other person on this program. <laughs> and Jennifer, congratulations to you for getting that award. Uh, again, long overdue and, uh, and highly deserved. I wonder, though, Jennifer, whether you think it's possible, if we're talking about recreating history and, and making sure it has its place in our society today, can any of these cemeteries that have been obliterated across Ontario, can they be recreated? You know, that's that's a that's a bigger question, and I think Elise might actually uh, be the better person to, to answer that because that's a specific work she does. But I think what it is is this. It's the stories of the people. It is their presence that has to be uh, honoured. You know, the film is called Speakers for the Dead because I was so aware that that no one was talking for them. No one was rep representing them. No one was advocating for them. You know, and for many of our experiences in, on these shores, that's been the history. So, um, so I'm not entirely sure how one would sort of reclaim those spaces. Um, but I know that the history, their presence, um, their stories is what we must reclaim and we must put this in our history books and we must change how we see um, these places uh, and these spaces. Elise, you want the last word on that? Can these grave sites be reclaimed and restored? Yes, they can. Uh, researching, uh, going through the registry and uh, finding the documentation, it's there. It just has to be ferreted out and then presented. And we have been working diligently, numerous of us, to present and preserve our history. It's just that we needed people like Jennifer to come along with her hungry eyes <laughs> and give us the opportunity to be on a, a larger platform. And appearing on a show like yours, Steve, is wonderful because it helps people to understand we are pioneers of this country. We helped to build this country. We were freedom fighters right here. And we have developed this country to a place where we can finally be on a television show that will help us put our trumpets out there and help people to understand that without black history, history is incomplete. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, I got... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I got some clapping hands from Jennifer, so we'll go for that too. Uh, Elise Harding Davis, Jennifer Holness, it's really great of both of you to honor us by appearing on our program, and we wish you continued success with the important work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. The terrorist group Boko Haram has abducted and brutalized thousands over the past decade in the East African country of Nigeria. That includes more than a thousand girls kidnapped from their schools and forced into unspeakable captivity. Canadian journalist Melissa Fung set out to document stories of some who survived and the bravery they've shown in forging new lives. In the process, she found herself reflecting on her own harrowing story of abduction. It's all contained in her new TVO original documentary. It's called Captive, that has its world broadcast premiere later tonight. And Melissa Fung joins us now from London, UK. It's so good to see you again. Uh, Melissa, congratulations on the documentary. Uh, you've done it again. And just before I even get you to say hello, why don't we show a clip so everybody can see what we're talking about here, okay? Still, if you would, Sheldon, please. Do you remember the person they married you off to? I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not
I show you this. See, this is where the, I was stabbed to. It's the same mark, yeah. So. Melissa, I gotta say it. You sure don't take the easy assignments. And of course, as we hinted in the introduction, this documentary is particularly poignant and personal for you. Why don't we start there? Explain why. First of all, Steve, I want to say it's so great to see you and, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it is personal and it it was more personal than I thought it was going to be when I first started looking into trying to tell this story. Um, you know, the word kidnapping is a real trigger for me. And so I think we all remember back in 2014 when we heard the news of, you know, Boko Haram kidnapping 276 girls overnight and disappearing them into the Sambisa forest in northeastern Nigeria. It was horrifying. I think we were all horrified. But for me, you know, every time I hear about a kidnapping, it's a bit of a trigger. And so the more I looked into Boko Haram and its its activities, the more I thought we just have not, we don't know enough. You know, there could be thousands of girls missing, kidnapped in the forest by Boko Haram. And it's a story that I, I felt um, the world needed to, to hear more about. Does it still, a decade later, even when you hear that word, take you back to Afghanistan? It, it does less so, not right back to Afghanistan. Um, but, you know, if I hear of another journalist or an aid worker who's been taken, um, it doesn't have to be Afghanistan. It could be, you know, Syria, uh, Nigeria, Yemen, any, any one of those places. I think of what they're going through those first few days um, and what their families must be going through those first few days because it's not something, um, it's not something that's natural. Um, to, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of worry there's a lot of stress there's a lot of fear um, and so you know it just really felt I felt like it was something that I needed to sort of give voice to what was going on in this particular part of the world with so many girls being kidnapped. Well, you're going to forgive the obvious question here, but if if doing this work can trigger you to the point where you recall your own kidnapping, and that obviously is a painful thing for you, why do this work? I am in a better place, Steve. It's been 12 years. Um, I have a unique perspective because of what happened to me. And in this case, with the girls, it, you know, it was like we understood each other. There was a, a bond, a connection that only really happens when you have had a similar experience, you know, a similar horrible experience. But I think the girls realized that they could trust me and that I could understand them in a way that few other journalists cannot. How do they know that you've been through that? Is that something you tell them or, or do they know? I was very open about it when I first met them. Um, you know, the local journalist, Kabir Anwar, who I've been working with all this time, you know, made it very clear to them, explained my background and why I was interested in making this film and interested in their stories. Um, and so, you know, before we even shot a frame, you know, we spent a few hours getting to know each other and they were very curious and I was very open. They wanted to know uh, what my kidnappers were like, where they kept me, what they fed me. Um, but they, they were very curious, and I was very honest and open. Well, that bond clearly paid off because, I mean, the, the, the conversations that you have managed to have during the course of this documentary are, well, they're extraordinary. And they're, I mean, we learn a great deal about a part of the world that we don't know much about. So kudos to you for doing this work. I do want to revert back to that first clip that we saw off the top of our conversation, where they talk about being you know, forced into marriage or married off or that kind of thing. And the word marriage is used and there's really nothing, I mean, this is not normal. This is not a normal marriage. Why the importance of using that word? 
they that clip that you used that was of Asmau, and she was only twelve years old when she was taken into the force and married off. And what married means is it's basically you know, what Boko Haram does to these girls is take them into the forest. They use them as trophies for their fighters, um, wives for their soldiers, um, and they, you know, even as suicide bombers, um, they'll send them back into their villages. But that word marriage means basically that they're enslaved to these men, these soldiers. You know, it, when you're 12 years old, obviously that means rape, sexual violence, um, and that's something that, you know, we don't... We don't discuss explicitly in the film because it's still so raw for the girls, but it is understood that, you know, this is this is what's happening. Girls as young as 12 years old, you just can't, there's no marriage um, in that case. You know, it's a forced marriage and that means violence. I think this first came to a lot of people's attention when Michelle Obama brought it to the world's attention. Again, we're going back to 2014, her uh, 276 girls kidnapped at the time. How many of that group has since returned home? I think the government um, did negotiate for the release of over a hundred girls. Um, and they, you know, the government took them into the re released girls into the into their custody, let them go back to school as a group, gave them counseling. And there have been many uh, other documentaries and stories done about that group of girls. There are still more than 100 girls from that group missing. Um, but what I wanted to do was make a point that, you know, my girls are not part of that group, that Chibok group that Michelle Obama was saying bring back. Um, my girls are some of the thousands who are taken every day, and it, it's it's still happening. You know, I just reports last week that Boko Haram overran a village and you know took captives back into the forest with them. And so I wanted to give these girls a voice. They didn't get the international attention that the Chibok girls got, um, but they're suffering the exact same trauma. And when these girls are kidnapped, can you give us some sense of whether they literally disappear without a trace or whether any communication happens between them and their families? Or what, what do we know of their circumstances once they're gone? Once they're in the forest, really, there's no communication between them or anybody in their family or their community. Um, you know, Asmau, who we saw in the clip, she still has a sister missing in the forest and it's been more than seven years now and there's been no word of her and you know her mother talks about that later in the film just the pain of knowing that you have a daughter out there maybe is she still alive you know they don't know how satisfied are you with what the nigerian government is either doing or not doing to secure the release of these girls um you know, they, they keep saying that they're winning the war against Boko Haram, you know, you know, and I get Google bulletins about any news that comes out of that part of the world. And, you know, they said that they killed 18 militants yesterday. So they do go in to the forest sometimes and launch attacks, often dropping bombs and creating chaos. And those are the conditions where my girls managed to escape when there has been a, a, a raid by the military. Um, but... The root of the problem right now is that Boko Haram is, is wants to build its own state in northeastern Nigeria, and so they're starting to offer services, not unlike what the Taliban did in Afghanistan, in, in southern Afghanistan, you know, offer social services, school opening Islamic schools, that type of thing, and and that's what you know, that's what the government really has to confront, I think, in order to get a get control of the situation in that region. Has the Nigerian government asked for international help in dealing with this issue? There has been, they haven't asked for help. There's been help given. I think the French government offered um, aid militarily. Um, our own government, um, in terms of the aid package that they give to Nigeria. I think um, in 2019, it was upwards of $115 million. 
a lot of that aid was earmarked for um, women and girls, empowerment, um, maternal health, that type of thing. And I think, you know, go, looking ahead, um, any kind of foreign assistance to Nigeria should keep in mind the stolen girls and what their needs are when they come back from captivity. I, I'm not just thinking about uh, financial resources, though. I'm wondering whether or not there's some kind of African military or rescue unit that could go in, or an international force that could go in. I appreciate that it's tricky. We're dealing with a sovereign nation here, and it's, it's difficult to go in uninvited. But are those options being considered? <sighs> I don't think so, Steve. I'm not sure that they they have been considered. Um, you know, and Boko Haram, in fact, is... I know for a fact, though, that the Nigerians have been working with their neighbors, um, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, because the Boko Haram insurgency has really um, spread into those countries, overflowed into um, having a lot of displaced people in all countries. You have Cameroonians fleeing and crossing the border to Nigeria, Nigerians going over to Niger. I mean, it's nobody's really keeping track, but I think that the governments are trying to work together to sort of quell some of the violence in that Lake Chad area. Hmm. Now, you referenced the Taliban a moment ago, and that's that's a, a good reference in as much as, why don't you remind everybody what, what Boko Haram actually means when translated into English? Yeah, in Hausa, Boko Haram means Western education is forbidden. Yeah, um, you know, Boko is education, Western education. Haram means forbidden. Um, and it's it's more than just that. It's sort of the whole Western way of life that Boko Haram is against. They're very Salafist um, when it comes to their, their fundamentalism. And, and they're one of a few terrorist groups that will attack other Muslims because they don't believe that they are following the rules of the Quran as they have interpreted it themselves. And so, you know, it's a very strict form of Islam. Um, girls don't go to school. It, very, not unlike the Taliban um, before, before they fell from power. Hmm. Uh, Melissa, I don't want to get overly graphic here. And, and, and the next question I'm about to ask is really uncomfortable, but uh, I think it needs to be asked. You know, these women are as you point out, being raped by their enslavers, and they are having children. Do we know what percentage are having children or what happens to those children once they're had and all of these very uncomfortable questions? We don't know the numbers that have had children born of their Boko Haram captors. Um, but, you know, in the film, one of the girls, Zara, she does have uh, a baby girl. Um, and she loves Aisha. You know, I, I asked her uh, several times, like, do you resent her? Because now you, you know, you didn't want this child. And, and in fact, she said, when I was, how could I be pregnant? You know, I'm a child myself. But, you know, you see that bond between her and her child now. Some cases, it's it's not as, not as, not as happy. Um, Fatima, the psychologist in the film, tell, tells us about a girl that she was trying to treat um, who was stomping on her baby, wanting him to die because she said she thought that this was, you know, from the devil. And so I think that's a, it's, it's, um, it's a complicated question that there's no, it's different for each girl and you know whatever they choose it's important that they have the support whether they want to keep their child or they want to give it up um, and just making sure that that support is there for them I think um, is what's really important but what needs to be an option is that girl who was wanting the child to die needs to have the psychological you know help for, for recovering from trauma that that many of these girls don't have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a, a bit of a higher angle look at this story for a second here because, and these numbers are, are quite astonishing, 30,000 people killed, 2 million people displaced from their homes since this insurgency began. We're talking about 2009. However, and we're going to pull another clip from your documentary here, 
There is humanitarian work that is being done. There is help being proffered. So let's take a look from Captive here, and we'll see another clip from your excellent documentary. Sheldon, if you would. By government estimates, I'm sure more than 100,000 that have come out of captivity. There was a lot of focus on humanitarian needs, quite rightly. Food, shelter, nutrition, health, but nobody was talking or thinking about mental health. Nobody was really accessing what they had been through, and so they were not able to build the resilience they needed to be able to get on with their life. These just must be some of the most difficult psychological cases anywhere in the world. Uh, how are they doing? Um, the girls who do have access to um, trauma therapy and counseling, I think, are doing well. And we saw that when we went to Dr. Akilu's Center for Rehabilitating Girls. Um, we were, you know, we got very fortunate to be able to spend some time um, watching what they do there and how they how they treat the girls. So there's art therapy. Um, there's music therapy, you know, they even teach them computer skills to sort of help them reintegrate into society. Um, the problem is that, you know, only a hundred girls can attend that school at a time because of the ratio of staff and counselors to girls. And there's just not enough, not enough resources in that, in that area to, to really begin to even treat all the girls um, and women who've been who've come back um, to to be able to make a difference. I mean, Fatima it, does such an amazing job. You know, she's got even something called Counselors on Wheels, where she sends counselors out in tuk tuks to remote villages to try to talk to women who come back from the forest. Um, but and there are many N NGOs who you know are doing similar work. Um, but in a part of the world, Steve, where, you know, most people are having trouble putting food on the table, keeping their families safe, mental health is really a luxury, you know, and it's not something that um, is first of mind for these, these survivors. But if they're fortunate enough to get that therapy, what are their chances thereafter of leading whatever a normal life in under those circumstances, however you want to define that? I think that remains to be seen. You know, I think we still are not sure. We're very hopeful. Um, you know, Dr. Akilu says she even, there's a, she's also runs a program for former Boko Haram fighters who are ready to come out of the forest and, and reconcile themselves. And um, there was an imam she was telling me about who we didn't get to meet, um, but he was a, a big uh, commander in Boko Haram, and he has since, after undergoing sort of rehabilitation, um, he's leading a normal life as an imam in Maiduguri now. Hmm. Melissa, I'm curious about uh, your document, your documentary filmmaking skills when the project is over. I wonder whether there's a part of you. Look, I don't know, I'm freelancing here, but is there a part of you that, that feels a bit guilty when you get to leave, whereas they're still there? I know how much you care about the people that you are trying to tell the stories of. D d is it hard for you to leave? Yeah, Steve, it is really hard to leave, you know, and I never really leave. I was supposed to go back twice last year after filming um, to see the girls. I I'm writing about them as well. Um, but of course, the pandemic happened and and I never got to go. But the girls in the film, you know, after after you see the end of the film, after I leave them, um, we didn't leave them. We Kabir, the local journalist I was telling you about, um, found them a boarding school to go to. And so they started going to the boarding school. Uh, unfortunately, their grades had fallen so far behind that they were asked to leave. And so long story short, um, we found them a day school, got them a tutor to try to get their grades up. And now we're trying to look for another boarding school 
um, when schools reopen that will take them. Hmm. So, no, I never really leave. These girls are, you know, they're in my heart. No, I can imagine that. And, and therefore, are you able to stay in touch with them even when you're outside the country? It's hard because now that they're back in their villages, there's very little access to um, internet. There's still the language barrier. My house is not very good. Their English is getting better. Um, so I, I'm, I am in touch with them through Kabir, and I get you know almost weekly updates on how they're doing. When COVID is more under control, do you hope to go back? Of course, I'm hoping. I, I'm hoping for some time this year. You know, hmm. I, I uh, need to go back and, and make sure they're doing okay. All right. In which case, let's finish up on this, Melissa. You, of course, wrote uh, a decade ago, uh, Under an Afghan Sky, a memoir of captivity. That was about your own story. And in the background piece, I do remember you saying, I thought it would be cathartic to write that book, but it wasn't. And if I had to do it again, I'm not sure I would. Uh, how about this documentary? Any regrets about making it? I am in a better place, Steve, and I think what I've learned in the last few years, you know, first of all, I have to say, you know, Linda and Jane at TVO were just so patient with me as I was trying to make this documentary. I didn't want it to be about me um, in, the, in the first place, but I learned so much that, you know, I'm even in a better place than I was when I started this this project, because what I've learned is that Recovering from trauma is a journey, and and you know the place where I was in Afghanistan, that hole, that's a part of me now, and it will always be. Um, but it led me to make this documentary and give voice to these girls, and so it's an it, you know it's a journey. Where it's going to lead me next, I don't know, but. But I'm in a place where I've accepted that the trauma that happened to me um, 12 years ago now, is it 12? Yeah, mm -hmm. more than 12 years ago now, um, has helped me grow in different ways. Melissa, you're amazing, and you do amazing work. So keep on keeping on, okay? Thanks, Steve. So Thanks good for having of, me. Not at all. So good of you to join us tonight. And we want to definitely remind everybody that they can see the world broadcast premiere of Melissa Fung's documentary, Captive. It's tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time on TVO and streaming on our website. That's TVO.org. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. Should countries leverage their access to vaccines to further their foreign policy objectives? We'll take a look at that tomorrow. Also, 50 years after a coup brought Idi Amin to power in Uganda, we'll assess the state of democracy in that East African country. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Two politicians. Hey. hey, how are you? Welcome nice to Payrolls, man. Yeah. With opposing points of view. This piece of legislation is a violation of basic uh, rights. We're on the line of individual rights. 